We're really honored and pleased to have Senator Udall uh, talk with us today about some of the uh, challenges and issues with energy innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. Good. Is it afternoon? It is afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to Washington, D.C. Uh, I do confess to you all I am a mountain, uh, mountaineer, a mountain climber, if you will. Uh, Robert, some of my friends think I killed so many brain cells climbing on some of the world's highest peaks, including Mount Everest, that I went into politics. But I'll let you all uh, draw your own uh, conclusions. Um, I'm here to uh, talk with you all about energy innovation and how Congress, the federal government, academia, and, the, and private industry can work together to support private sector ingenuity and research. Uh, and I do look forward, to, after my prepared remarks, to some questions and a chance to interact with all of you. Um, and in that spirit, let me start with what uh, my friend uh, Senator John McCain likes to call uh, straight talk. Uh, some of you may be wondering to yourselves whether those of us here in Washington and the systems by which we govern ourselves can really uh, make a difference. Uh, given that we, right now, Robert, we just seem to have trouble keeping the federal government running uh, in the first place. And some days I'm reminded of uh, the old Groucho Marx line. He, he said famously, politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly, and then applying the wrong remedies. Um, but regardless of how you feel about politics, or Washington, D.C., our country is, is facing a tremendous challenges. We're uh, in the throes of digging out from the worst economy since literally the Great uh, Depression. And uh, while we've got a lot of different ideas here in Washington, how we get ourselves back on track, uh, all of us uh, in the Congress care a great deal about helping make that a reality. Now, uh, Ronald Reagan, gosh, I'm quoting a lot of Republicans here. I hope you all know I'm a Democrat. but. Um, you know, Bill Clinton once said, I hope there are Republicans here, I hope they're independents, I hope they're Green Party people, I hope there are even maybe some, some anarchists as well, some Democrats. But um, Bill Clinton once said, you know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of decent people who are Republicans, they're just wrong. But actually, actually there are a lot of Republicans who have great ideas and are right. Uh, but Ronald Reagan said, and this, this is rife with irony, he said, I'm not worried about our debt, it's big enough to take care of itself. Um, but how we deal with our staggering debt is really the biggest challenge uh, that we have in the near term. And I'm praying, hoping, uh, believing that we're going to get some answers soon in the form of recommendations from the Congressional Super Committee and that their work will then set the stage for the next uh, several years. So, well, how does that relate to what I'm talking about here today? Well, for one thing, everything we're doing is focused on the economy and then seen through the lens of how it will affect our aggregated debt, which is almost the size of our GDP right now, $15 trillion in GDP, $15 trillion in debt. And any objective economist will tell you that's not sustainable. Um, that creates real problems. So the super committee's decisions are going to help determine our priorities and how we respond to our future energy needs, because I'm going I'm to continue bringing this back to energy. Uh, the challenges that the super committee confronts uh, underscore the in incredibly important choices, dilemmas, opportunities that we face when it comes to using the resources that we have right now. When I say resources, I mean not just money, but I mean uh, brain power, natural resources, and the like. Uh, it wouldn't surprise you if I say it. I think we've got to be focused on strengthening our economy for the future. And that means we've got to put our best efforts, our best energy into spurring, promoting, fostering, and nurturing innovation. Uh, if you tie that concept to entrepreneurship, which has always really been a hallmark and a powerful driver of our economy, uh, it all fits together. Because ta where talent leads, innovation, jobs, and then economic growth will follow. And my opinion uh, is that, uh, and it's based on the insights and the thoughts of some of you in this room, literally countless experts uh, around the world um, is that energy innovation is the key to winning what we're in right now, which is a global economic race. We have some of the best ideas in the world in this country, especially when it comes to energy, but with the growing international competition, we have to continue to make investments to keep those ideas uh, turning over. So we got to keep turning those ideas out. Again, I'm not telling you all anything you don't know, but I want to emphasize 
that there are policymakers here in this town that, that understand that that's what we face. Um, DOE's ARPA-E is a great example of how we're working to preserve our leadership. I think you've, you heard from Arun um, uh, this morning. He's a phenomenal talent. Uh, he's the best America has. Uh, and he's leading a team of experts that's making significant contributions to energy innovation. And ARPA-E is unique in that it, it focuses on really promising ideas, but as you all know, they're risky. And, and, and that's the whole point. Uh, and even in these times of budget cuts and fiscal discipline, we've got to continue uh, work, cutting edge work in research and development uh, through the kind of uh, R&D efforts that ARPA-E applies. Uh, we've also got to continue to work in the public-private partnership area. And that's an idea, Robert, I want to highlight that uh, you, uh, along with your colleagues at ITIF and, and the Breakthrough Institute, uh, highlighted in your report that you released earlier this month. And you focused on the investment deficit. And you, you defined that as that's the money that we aren't spending on things like what? Infrastructure, education, and R&D. And the importance of this is that those are actually the building blocks that we've got to put in place so that our economy can strengthen over time and we can uh, maintain our leadership role. Uh, a strong nation, a secure nation, is a nation that has a, has a strong economic presence. Uh, so in sum, what I'm saying is we can't afford to discourage in energy innovation. It's just, that, it's just that simple. But focusing on innovation isn't enough. In order for our country to work, we need government to work. Uh, and again, this is my view. Uh, but I think it's shared government's job is to provide leadership on difficult issues so our country works better. We get into some debates in this town, big government, small government. For me, that's not really where the issue lies. It's not really at the core of the debate. It's can we create and promote a smarter and more efficient government, a government that's up to the challenges of today. And if you'll indulge me, uh, I want to connect that to some ideas that I've introduced as legislative vehicles uh, that I think meet that standard, a smarter and more efficient government. And these particular legislative initiatives would support increased use of renewable energy and uh, encourage us to invest in revolutionary energy technology. So let me start uh, with a bill that I've introduced to help encourage the Department of Energy to reduce its dependence on fossil fuels. It's called the Department, it's not too long a title, the Department of Defense Energy Security Act. The acronym is DODESA, and there will be a quiz on that, that later. Robert talked about my energy committee assignment, um, but I am gonna all, I'm going to link that, in effect, to the Armed Services Committee assignment I have, along with my Intelligence Committee assignment. Um, DODESA attempts to remove some of the bureaucratic obstacles to smarter energy use and development. For one, it provides the Department of Defense with the, uh, um, the authority to enter into 20-year fuel procurement contracts so that industry partners can recoup their investments. I'm sure some of you are following this whole concept of PPAs, power purchase agreements, and the way in which they can drive markets. This, that, this is a variation on that or, or a, a, a sibling to that kind of a concept um, on the electricity side. It takes steps, this bill, to ensure funding for energy management efforts like the Energy Conservation Investment Program, the, the uh, acronym is pronounced ESIP. Um, the bill would also help DOD better understand how to incorporate smart grid technology and work with local communities to develop contingency plans in the event of a power outage caused by cyber attacks or natural disasters. And on a personal note, uh, as well as a professional, I, I, I want to uh, let you all know that th this bill allows me to continue the work of Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. Uh, she and I worked on the inaugural version uh, of this bill uh, last year, and her staff have shown uh, incredible initiative and resourcefulness uh, in, in her absence. Uh, Gabby uh, really gets this, and I'm looking forward to having her back on the Hill full time to continue our work together. Now, I alluded to what I'm going to say now just a, a minute or two ago, but some of you may ask, why did I bring up the DOD instead of the DOE, the Department of Energy here at an energy conference? And there, there are several reasons. First, there's the economic effect. The uh, United States Department of Defense 
alone consumes more fuel than most countries. For every $10 increase in the cost of a barrel of crude, DOD's annual fuel budget jumps by over a billion dollars. That's real money. I know a lot of you in this room, you'd, you'd take a hundredth of that uh, to put to work in some of the ideas that you have. And when our debt looms is really a national security concern, that's really, that's really serious business and those are numbers that can make a difference if we get them going the right way. Second, there's a national security effect. When um, we get to the point, uh, and, I'm, and I'm being the terminal optimist I generally am, when we get to the point where we're using less energy from unstable parts of the world, that means we can spend less time protecting our fuel assets overseas and focus instead here on education and economic development and the sorts of things you all are discussing here. Just think about the costs we incur in protecting oil supply lines. They're very, very significant. And then finally, and what's probably most important, even though the, the previous two reasons I laid out for you are crucial, is the direct effect uh, a better approach would have on our men and women in uniform. Our reliance on fossil fuels creates vulnerabilities and barriers here at home and abroad. Literally thousands of our fellow Americans have been wounded or tragically killed while escorting fuel and water convoys into Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's something that uh, our bill hopes to change uh, by authorizing the increased development of alternative fuels and the increased use of hybrid drive systems and electric uh, vehicles. And uh, I wrote here, if we find a solution, I'm going to say when we find a solution, uh, one that will enable our troops to fight longer without refueling, that allows them to be more nimble and independent, and in the process we save American lives. Admiral Mullen put this really well recently. He's just retired as chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He said, saving energy saves lives. It's that, it's that straightforward, that simple. Uh, and just think about the geopolitical flexibility we would have um, and again, referencing my uh, service on, on the Intelligence Committee and the, and the Senate Armed Services Committee, if we weren't uh, in these, if you will, deadly embraces or uncomfortable embraces with countries that have oil, like Venezuela, Iran, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan. I think Kazakh, the Kazakhs are probably the friendliest group in that list there, but um, just think about the flexibility we would we have now to be fair the Department of Defense is they're, they're on point they know this is an opportunity they know this is a challenge they know this is a vulnerability so they've been doing uh, everything they possibly can I think I don't you heard from Admiral McGinn or not but but I certainly I just saw Danny out front and he's been a real leader on this but I want us to do more uh, and uh, by putting these ideas into the law formalizing the policy uh, we can do more uh, so as I begin to uh, summarize here let me emphasize again that I believe energy independence, clean energy technology, and efficiency are what will make or break our leadership as a country uh, in the 21st century. And if you look at that in this most broad respect, that means that we can't just focus on one solution. We have to uh, have an all of the above approach that includes all energy sources from renewables to safe nuclear power to natural gas. And in, in so doing, we diversify energy sources, we stabilize prices, we create new jobs, and we make our country uh, more secure. Uh, and since I first entered Congress, and my hair was your color when I entered Congress, uh, I've been working hard to uh, ensure that these important objectives are reflected in public policy. I would add as an aside, I also continue looking for the best ways that our policy creates a level playing field. So all these technologies and fuel types can compete. Easy to say, a lot harder to do, but that's um, been one of my central goals. Let me touch on one other piece of legislation that I've introduced, and it's the uh, entitled the Electric Consumer Right to Know Act, or conveniently ENO. And ENO will give consumers the right to access their electricity information, uh, such as timing and costs. And armed with information, then uh, it's my belief that citizens can better manage their power consumption and then save money on electric bills. Another quintessential principle we he have here in the United States. And the cool thing about this idea is um, this is something that won't drag us into arguments about subsidies or whether we're choosing technological winners or losers. It's simply 
focused on getting information which is valuable to consumers so they can decide how to best use electricity. And then that in turn I believe will help unleash innovation and then nurture new discoveries as they're transformed into products and services in the private sector. Let me go back to what I said about government. Uh, but government can't do this alone. We need businesses, state and local governments, and other stakeholders at the table. And my job, I believe, and the job of uh, all leaders in Congress is to help ensure that folks like those of you who are here in the room are supported and encouraged by policies that help create jobs and power our communities. You're the leaders, you're the thinkers, you're the doers in multiple energy fields. Energy policy advocates, business leaders, innovators, environmental leaders, government officers, academics, technology companies. Uh, there are students here uh, as well. Uh, there's a whole array of brain power that fuels our nation's progress. In fact, um, is Andy Valenti here? Where's Andy? Is he here? I heard he was going to be here. There he is back over here. So we've, we've got the University of Virginia in the house. Go Cavs. Go Hoos. My daughter's at the University of Virginia, so I want to give the University of Virginia a shout out. Uh, so Andy, great to have you here. Um, I'm probably in trouble with him, but uh, he didn't know I was going to do that. Uh, but again, I want to emphasize, it's, it's all of you in this room that we owe an obligation to and a responsibility to as policymakers to, to empower. Now, I don't want to make it sound easy because there are a host of issues that need to be addressed. Uh, transmission, consumer education, privacy, and grid security, and, and especially cyber security. Uh, we want to make sure, Robert, as we move to new technologies, we don't in, in inadvertently create new security vulnerabilities uh, that can be exploited. And there's, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of work going on. This isn't simple in this area of cyber. Um, but as leaders, I, th I think you would agree, we can't wait uh, to the next energy crisis, nas uh, national, uh, nas I should say natural disaster or national tragedy forces us to act. Investments and in innovation by industry are s essential to helping our country transition to a more affordable, reliable, and secure uh, energy future. So here's my call to action for you all. I want you to keep pushing at all levels. I don't want you to be shy. I want you to educate us here in Washington. I want you to be working across disciplines. And above all, we've got to continue uh, to innovate. Uh, I like to tell uh, uh, young people and uh, those who are a little more senior like myself who come to Washington, you, you own this place. Uh, we're supposed to work for you. I hope when you're in D.C. your shoulders are back, your head's high, you feel proud, you feel the sense of history uh, here. Uh, but if you think about the, the history of our country, uh, we've innovated in all kinds of areas, including innovations uh, in the area of human rights, in self-government, in what we hold dear. Just think about the, uh, the founders, the founding fathers and mothers, and what they laid out as uh, fundamental principles that we still hew to today. But as we innovate going forward, uh, and if we put the right building blocks in, in place to support that innovation, Truly, the, the sky's the limit. But energy policy, energy technology, energy innovations are the way we win the global economic race in the 21st century. Thanks for having me. Look forward to your questions. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, sir. Uh, Senator, thank you. If you have time for just a couple, sure. least, let me start off with one. Um, if you're not careful, I'll sit down, we'll get comfortable, and then you can sit down, we'll get a, out of here. a couple of beers. Uh, <laughs> you know, Colorado's the number one beer producer in the country, speaking of a form of energy. So I want you all to take, if you don't take anything away from today, uh, it's a form of ethanol, I think, right? Or some, but anyway, we're proud of our, our beer producers. It's, it's some kind of power. It's some kind of power, yes. Uh, it, it's uh, coincidental that today is also the day where there's a hearing on the Hill on Solyndra. Yeah. And I, I think in one sense, there, there's a risk, obviously a huge risk there that Solyndra will tarnish the notion that government can play a productive role in driving uh, clean energy uh, independence and innovation. On the other hand, it's perhaps an opportunity. It suggests m maybe we need to refine, maybe we need to change course a bit and, and hone in a little bit. But my question for you is, 
How do you see this playing out in the Senate where uh, ENR has had a tradition of being slightly more bipartisan than, than some other committees and, and has a history of being able to work on both sides of the aisle? How do you see the prospects for progress over the next year or two in, uh, in, in ENR and in these issues and the ability to uh, have uh, the Republicans support perhaps some investments and, and Democrats maybe support some out-of-the-box thinking as well? If I might, let me just speak to Solyndra for a, a, a minute, hopefully at the most. Uh, the whole point of a loan guarantee program is to take some risks uh, to help our own homegrown countries compete and bridge that gap between uh, an idea and applying it in a product. Uh, having said that, I welcome uh, in an objective and bipartisan way a, a uh, survey of an investigation of uh, what happened at Solyndra. That's how you, you, you get better. Uh, if you look more broadly though at the loan guarantee program, there are a lot of successes there. Uh, there's a lot to be proud of. Uh, but we ought to be open about getting to the bottom of what happened. Uh, my worry, of course, is sometimes in this town the politics become more important than the, than the policies uh, that we're discussing. I would also add one other comment about Solyndra. As we know, the, there are other countries that are not waiting for us to decide what we're doing. Uh, the EU, uh, China, uh, Australia, the list is a long, a long list. Uh, these leaders in these countries see the opportunity here. And by the way, they're not doing this just to feel good uh, because they happen to hail, say, from a liberal community uh, like a Berkeley or a Boulder, Colorado or a Madison, Wisconsin, which are sometimes stereotyped in that regard. But they see the job creation and the uh, opportunity in the leadership role. So we should, we should understand that in part what uh, put Solyndra on the ropes was these uh, immense Chinese subsidies for their own clean energy and energy efficiency technologies. On the more broader question, I, I'm, I've been very pleased with what the Energy Committee accomplished in the last Congress. We had a broad reaching, comprehensive energy bill that was designed to be coupled with a price on carbon. I support a price on carbon. Uh, I think we missed an opportunity in the last Congress to do so. I think the idea uh, is, is well vetted. Uh, it's helped uh, drive down uh, acid rain emissions in the Northeast, uh, and the, the uh, doomsayers were proven uh, badly wrong uh, in the process of impl implementing that approach. Can we uh, re-engage uh, uh, and put a comprehensive bill back uh, together in time, uh, for the, by the time this Congress adjourns? I don't know, Robert. Uh, there were a lot of complex uh, moving parts in the bill from transmission to the Green Energy Bank to small modular nuclear reactors. Uh, there was a lot of work done to craft the bill. There were some trade-offs as there always are. What I see us doing now is going for some smaller bites. Uh, perhaps there's opportunities uh, on transmission. Perhaps there's opportunities on a clean energy bank. And then we, we're all, we've also, I think, uh, at risk of not doing something on drilling safety given what happened in the Gulf last year. So I think, in summary, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you probably not to set your sights too high, uh, but uh, the let's keep at it. There's too much opportunity here, and frankly, there's danger if we, if we don't act. Uh, but we can, through the appropriations process, uh, support RPE, support the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, support the, the research and development that's really making a difference, and, and then look for other opportunities. Great. So I don't know where you are on time. Uh, you need to wrap up. Phew. One question. Um, we'll, we'll take six or eight more questions. We'll no. take six or eight no. more questions, and then a uh, couple of cases of Colorado right. beer. Yeah, then we're, yeah, we'll the fat tire is what we want to be drinking, isn't it? I think. Mm. It's a great. That's a one of the great Colorado brews. Yes, exactly. So I yeah. saw this gentleman here. I'm going to let you yeah. go first, if you can. Yeah. Can you stand up and project? Thank you. You're from Col You're from Massachusetts. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. That. The, um, and you. You could. I'm sure give a tutorial on decoupling. But it, it, the idea, and it's being implemented, I think, in, in California. You may have to correct me, but in Massachusetts as well, is is an it's an idea to create a, a little more of a supply and demand pricing system that allows uh, utilities, munis, REAs, uh, writ broadly, to uh, turn a profit on efficiency gains. 
Uh, right now, the way in which we pay for power uh, is often uh, has perverse incentives. The more you use, the less you pay. To be to simplify it, uh, but there are states, there are utilities, and there and there are regions that are playing with, toying with, and in fact implementing some ideas where you can uh, decouple. Uh, the way in which you use energy from the way in which it's it's priced traditionally, and so then you you drive investments in efficiency in the built environment, and this is this is aimed at the built environment, not at vehicles. But and and it, it's really showing some important results. There's an interesting parallel in the West. You know, there's an old saying in the West, Rocky Mountain West. I get in trouble with my California, Oregon friends. They say when I say I'm from the West, they say you're from the near West. We're from the far west, uh, the, the, but to uh, the Rocky Mountain West, water, of course, is probably the most valuable, precious resource we have. Uh, and there's an old saying, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting over uh, in the Rocky Mountain West. But that was the way in which we managed our water supplies in places like Denver. The more water you use, the less it costs you per unit of water. Denver Water's actually turned that around, and they, they have a tiered pricing system. And up to a certain number of gallons, you pay a low rate for your water, and then as you increase that usage, Robert, you, you, you pay an additional amount. So it really drives uh, efficient technology, uh, smarter use, and the conservation uh, of a resource that's expensive and, and very, very valuable. And I think you could apply that same uh, characterization to, to electricity, of course. So that so anyway, let's, yeah, I'd love anything else you have and ideas you have on, on decoupling. By the way, the other thing I'd say, because I, I will take one other question if there's interest, um, is that thank God for federalism. Um, by that I mean the idea that we, we can govern at the local level, make policy decisions, because where I really see the action right now, Robert, is at the state, regional, county, and city level. And again, not in the places where you might expect it to be happening, uh, Colorado Springs, which is stereotypically considered a very conservative city, uh, is actually much more diverse than that. Uh, and they're experimenting with lowering their carbon emissions, with switching their muni, uh, their municipal power system, over to a significant use of green power. Uh, they're encouraging their citizens to retrofit their homes, to save electricity. Uh, in the end, this is about the bottom line and, and there are ways to uh, now increasingly to make that or make that a reality. So I urge you know all of you uh, get a little frustrated with this at the national level. Push us. Uh, and while I work for a price on carbon and then a national RPS, and then encouraging the Pentagon to to go big uh, and make sure NREL and the research and development efforts are funded. There's an awful lot we can do at the local level, and we can do as consumers because that that's that dollar you spend. Uh, can really a add up and make a difference. That doesn't mean that the federal government can continue to be MIA. At some point, we got to get on the playing field and provide some leadership. You want to do one more? Sure, I'll do one more. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to do the one we, we yeah. just handed in. Uh, and I'm gonna so it's always it. dangerous because this will be the really hard question. Now, the really hard question is this one, which <laughs> I'm not going to read. Uh, oh, wow. Can I take that with me and do an so open well. book? Yeah. yeah. You and I would both fail this question. I'm get, I'll get my, my UVA. Uh, students to help me answer it properly. This one I think you can answer. Uh, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, which is what are the major objections of, of the folks in Congress who, who have questions or concerns about moving more aggressively in, into a clean energy, into a clean energy policy? Yeah. Uh, how, how do you, and how, and how do we respond to those effectively? I think, I think there, people fit into different categories. Um, there are those that think the climate science, for example, isn't settled and therefore we shouldn't burden the private sector in our country uh, with policies that will drive up the cost of energy. Uh, and th that's, that's one, one block uh, of, uh, or one point of view in the Congress. There are also regional differences. That's, an, that's another very interesting uh, part of serving here is, and you, you all uh, I think are probably well versed in civics and you, you know the history of the forming of the House and the Senate. Um, and, and people really do look out after their states and their, and their regions. And in particular, I'm not telling anything, saying anything you I wouldn't say in other settings, but the southeastern part of the country is very concerned about a renewable portfolio standard because they don't believe they have much in the way of wind or sun. I note that Florida is the sunshine state, but I'll leave that um, there for a second. They do have abundant amounts of biomass, and increasingly we, we've uh, discovered how to use biomass in a renewable fashion, in an environmentally friendly fashion. 
Uh, I also make the case to that the members of that region of the country, if you really think about this and look at the economics, you'll, you'll level natural gas prices. You'll also create supply chains. A lot of the manufacturing uh, activity in the country is now in the southeast. Uh, you would be building the wind turbines and the solar cells uh, and the parts that support uh, those energy technologies uh, in the southeast. Uh, you then have the broader philosophical discussion about subsidies and advantaging one technology over uh, another. What gets forgotten though often, and I alluded to this in my comments, is the tens of billions of dollars we spend to defend oil supply lines. Uh, those, th that's a significant externality that uh, is, not, is not always considered on the, on the part of the people who say, well, we, we have oil supplies. Why should we try and develop uh, third, fourth, fifth generation biofuels, uh, for, for example? Uh, and then, then overarching all of that is the very difficult economic, uh, uh, bus uh, fiscal environment, uh, budget, uh, fiscal and budget environment we find ourselves in. Uh, and, and that may be the, the biggest challenge we have right now. And that's why your voices are really, really important. I could leave, uh, maybe leave it on that note, that that's why uh, when the economy is so much on our minds and the way in which we get our economy growing is to innovate, you have a really strong case to make. If you look at mature economies, we can't grow by going backwards or wishing the good old days to, to arrive on our doorstep again today. You, you, you innovate. And innovation are new products, new services, new ways of doing business. And uh, that's what you all are about. So uh, thanks again for being such a nice audience. Nobody threw anything at me. Uh, you are uh, uh, inspiring to me. And uh, keep, keep at it. Um, thanks for what you're doing. It's really great, really a treat to be here so, with you. Senator, I, I want to thank you. I, thank you, you. You laid out a lot of obstacles there, but what makes me somewhat optimistic is leadership like yours uh, up there fighting that fight and, and helping to advance that. So we really appreciate you, you being here and your leadership on the Hill to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Join me in thanking Senator Udall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. All right, so we're going to jump right into our next panel. And uh, so if I could ask the next uh, folks to come on up.